Uh, this is this is your first studio album in five years, but it is one that w- was recorded in Brazil, New York, and L.A. And you've lived in New York, you've lived in the U.K., you lived in Brazil. Uh, wh- where do you self-identify as home? I uh, identify my home in my luggage. <laughs> I, but I will say that home is New York. Yeah, my place. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker in and today's New Yorker. day. Yes. And and on this album, you sing in French, in English, in Portuguese. But, but when you're working on a song, do you consciously decide which language language it's going to be sung in, or does it just come out a certain way? It comes out. You know, you never know. Like so sometimes I'm writing a song, and I I can hear sometimes the whole song that's the ideal inspiration that it comes with the words as well and the words can be english or portuguese french is the first time now and i don't speak french well don't don't even try but sometimes i only have melodies coming in and then i incorporate the chord changes and then i incorporate the words but the ideal inspirations like um, let me give you a good example of that Areia, for instance, is a song that we are not playing today, but it's uh, from the album, from Tudo. That is a song that came on, like, music, melody, you know, everything Mm -hmm. together. But does that mean you think of a certain song in English and then you think of another song in Portuguese? Yes. That's fascinating. That's how it is. Like Tudo, for instance, which Mm -hmm. is the, the title of the album, which means everything. Why I had the melody and the idea and the name. And when I call Adriana Calcanhoto, who is an incredible songwriter and singer from Brazil, we actually did that uh, through Instant Messenger. <laughs> and I was like, Adriana, I'm stuck with the words. Can you please help me out? Talking about, of course, a relationship. And I wanted to call Tudo. And then she mentioned like the feather uh, pillow which I was like, and I was thinking all about Feather Pillow. How did you read my mind? So this kind of things I love. And this is the beauty about, you know, making music with people that you know and sharing inspiration together. The records that uh, I've known you for more, for more recently, the success you had with uh, Tanto Tempo, for example, earned earn you this reputation for fusing, for being an innovator. You're fusing electronic sounds with more traditional bossa nova, for example. This album uh, and the last one, you've returned to more traditional, Brazilian arrangements. Tell me about that decision. Um, it was more like that we did the album in two months. <laughs> so it was very fast. And most of the guys, actually all of them, they, they play the album. So um, instead of just adding and treating and, and mixing it and adding more things, I think that's a question more for the producer, Mario Caldato. He, he, I think, wanted to cap what we did in studio, so we do have a lot of effects, but we didn't take that much advantage on this time. And uh, it feels perfect for me, especially because we had strings, for instance, on this one, which was incredible. Miguel Atwood Ferguson did incredible arrangements. We have acoustic bass, which I never had before, too. So it's it, it was a it was a different album with a different. What vibe. happened to the acoustic bass player today? The acoustic bass player today. Well, it's a question. Unfortunately, he couldn't get a visa to oh, come. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know it's John doing all the work there. But John is a genius. John can. <laughs> yeah, we can go playing all the parts. Oh yeah. Uh, this is you. have such a fascinating story. I've wanted to interview you for a long time because your first studio recording was at the age of seven. And yes. uh, you performed at Carnegie Hall alongside Stan Gatz at the age of nine. I mean, this is remarkable stuff. I talked about your family history uh, earlier. Was there ever any uh, possibility that you were going to be anything but a singer-songwriter growing up, given your family? No. This was You knew this was what you were going to do from when you oh, were a yes. little kid. Yeah. And when did you know that this was... Uh, I mean, did you always know you loved it? No, actually, I, I didn't like it that much, especially when my father woke me up in the middle of the night to sing for his friends, you know, and then it was a little... But I liked to be on stage and everything. And when I did the calling, you know, I remember my mother telling me, I had said that so many times in interviews, but she was like, you got to be charming. And then I just, I went on stage and I said, just blinking to everyone because I thought being right. charmer is like that you know right. so it's kind of funny 
And then I did like it, but the best thing was meeting Dizzy Gillespie backstage, you know, blowing his cheeks and looking at me and making me laugh because I was kind of sleepy. I didn't know what big deal was, but then later on, my uncle, Chico Buarque, when I came back from for Brazil on my age of 11, he had just did a musical called Os Saltimbancos, uh, based on the Saltimbanque, Saltimbanque, the, the Brothers Grimm mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. the, the dog, the, the, the chicken, and the, the, the Duncan. <laughs> and then uh, we, he did the, the story inspired on the music, and it, we, we, they needed a core with children. So I immediately became the leader, and I did the recordings, the arrangements, all the all start doing the arrange the vocal arrangements with my mom as well, mm. and then I did the play for another two years. So let's say it was a project from since I was eleven until I was thirteen. Did you ever go to school? Then I left the school by that time. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, yeah, and then I I started really. But you know, the but it's such an interesting story with you because <laughs> working, you moved yeah. you moved to America then you go to you moved to New York and you've said before that it was in going to to New York and living in America that you really found your voice. As regards to Brazil, you you needed that kind of distance. Oh to, yeah, why is but that? But I was that much before before that. Then when I came back to Brazil, I did a play, and then I start doing all the recordings, participations, and later on, I did first my EP when I was twenty. Mm. Then five four years later, I moved to New York, and then I found really the sound that I wanted. Why did it take moving to New York to find a sound that is actually? in touch with your Brazilian roots? Mm, because at that time I loved Chade, I loved Bjork, I loved uh, Prince, I loved everything, but not what was going on in Brazil. Unfortunately, the 80s, in my opinion, it was much more rock Brazilian music than more interesting as it was in the 60s and the 70s. And in the 90s, a lot of things that I was looking for were happening. So I was in search for that. And Did part of you feel like I, I don't want to do what my dad does? I don't want to. I don't. I, I, I got to be my own person. Oh, I got to be a rebel. That for got... sure. That's why you know I was wondering why I didn't play my mother today, but I love Astros. <laughs> so, it's not a problem. Sorry, we, we, there's too many family Ipanema. members doing too many impressive things with you. Like, we no, couldn't keep but, up. You know, to get me to sing out from Ipanema, I think. It's going to be a hard one. Right. That one's a little too. Well, well, it was just a few years ago, I understand, you took up playing guitar, which is interesting because your father, Jao Gilberto, is one of the greatest Brazilian guitarists. But you didn't seek out help from him because you said you were intimidated to ask him. Yeah. He's your father. Why were you intimidated by him? Oh, because he's my father and he thinks that I'm not perfect. Only him. <laughs> but anyway, Maz is the one who encouraged me and, you know, and then I start playing, playing, and then sometimes you see the guitar not in the, you know, the bench, and it was like, oh, I can see you've been playing. And I was like, no, I wasn't playing. <laughs> and then one day I just took the the new young song, Harvest Moon, yes. and I re harmonized it all, and then we played at the Carnegie Hall together, yeah. and it was amazing. And it was my debut, so two debuts. And that song is on the new record. Yes, it's it's it is. a beautiful yeah, rendition. It yeah, it is. Thank you. Uh, I hope he likes it. I, I'm, I'm oh, curious. you don't know if Neil Young's heard it? No, no, I don't. Mm. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll He's going to like it, I hope. I, I think so, too. It's a, it's, it's a lovely rendition. Um, to, to do, you said the name of the album translated in English, translates in English to everything. And you've said that as a Brazilian, you feel everything and live every moment deeply. What do you mean by that? So much happening in my head and so much happened on my life in my life in the last two years. I went through a lot of stuff, a lot, including recording the DVD, breaking another ankle, and uh, you know, divorce, lots of stuff. So to do means a lot. <laughs> and uh, mm. I will leave everything together to make a beautiful album like that. Breaking another ankle. How many ankles have you broken? Two. Wow. You've got the full set mm -hmm. yeah, of, of Broken Ink. And, and just very quickly, because we only have a, a 30 seconds here, and I want to make sure that you, that you get to play another song. We're so happy to have you and your band here. Um, what, what do you make of the controversy around the World Cup and, and Brazil? Are, is it something, where, where do you stand on? I know that there are some Brazilians who aren't happy that the World Cup is there, who are worried about the impact of spending all that kind of money on the World Cup. There are others who are very excited. What, what, where do you stand on I this? I would rather don't get involved. 
<laughs> All right. Well, that's a statement in itself.